Thank you. We will now restart proceedings and we will now proceed with the division on amendment number eight. And members should cast their vote now. The vote is now closed. The result of the vote on amendment number eight in the name of Maggie Chapman is yes, 19, no, 89. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment nine in the name of Maggie Chapman, already debated with amendment eight. Maggie Chapman to move or not move? Moved. The question is that amendment nine be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. The parliament is not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their vote now. The vote is now closed. The result of the vote on amendment number nine in the name of Maggie Chapman is yes, 20, no, 88. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call Amendment 10 in the name of Maggie Chapman, already debated with Amendment 9. Maggie Chapman to move or not move? Moved. Sorry. Moved. The question is that Amendment 10 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. The Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their vote now.
The vote is now closed. A uh, point of order, Foisal Chowdhury. Uh, Mr Chowdhury, are you seeking to make a point of order? I, I can see if it's of any help that, uh, in fact, Mr Chowdhury's vote has been recorded. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chaudhry. Ah. Oh, sorry. The result of the vote on amendment number 10 in the name of Maggie Chapman is yes, 20, no, 89. Uh, there were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. And I call amendment 11 in the name of Maggie Chapman, already debated with amendment 8. Maggie Chapman, to move or not move? And moved. Moved. The question is, uh, therefore, that amendment 11 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division, and members should cast their vote now. The vote is now closed. Point of order, George Adam. Uh, we need Mr Adam's microphone. Has Mr Adam got his card in? Apologies, presiding officer, that never happens to me. Uh, but uh, just to say that the voting app never worked and I would have voted no. Thank you, Mr Adam. Your vote will be recorded. Point of order, Foisal Chaudhry. I ha I'm having a connection issue. I would have voted yes. Thank you, Mr Chaudhry. Your vote will be recorded. The result of the vote on amendment number 11 in the name of Maggie Chapman is yes, 18, no, 90. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. That ends consideration of amendments. As members will be aware, the presiding officer is required under standing orders to decide whether or not, in her view, any provision of a bill relates to a protected subject matter. That is, whether it modifies the electoral system and franchise for Scottish parliamentary elections. In the case of this bill, in the presiding officer's view, no provision of the Post Office Horizon System Offences Scotland Bill relates to a protected subject matter. Therefore, the bill does not require a supermajority to be passed at stage three. The next item of business is a debate on motion 13407 in the name of Angela Constance on Post Office Horizon System Offences Scotland Bill at stage three. I would invite those members who, who would wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons and I call on Cabinet Secretary Angela Constance to speak to and to move the motion. Up to seven minutes, please. Signing officer, I am very pleased to open this stage three debate on the Post Office Horizon System Offences Scotland Bill. 
Following the UK Government's Post Office Horizon System Offences Bill receiving Royal Assent on Friday, we have brought forward the Stage 3 debate as we had committed to do so, uh, thereby securing justice for the victims of the Post Office Horizon scandal. As Cabinet Secretary, I'm as sorry possible. to interrupt for a second. Could I please say to those members who leave in the Chamber to please do so quickly and quietly, because the Cabinet Secretary is trying to make her contribution. Thank you. Thank you, President Officer. In taking this legislation through Parliament, I am pleased to have worked with colleagues from all parties in the Chamber to ensure that the Bill delivers the best possible outcome for Scottish sub-postmasters. Whilst we cannot ever fully remedy the heart and harm caused to those who have suffered a miscarriage of justice, I am grateful to parliamentary colleagues for ensuring that we have, at this stage, moved swiftly and worked effectively together to do what is within our power to address matters. And once again, I want to pay direct tribute to the sub-postmasters and their supporters who have done so much and endured so much, but done so much to ensure that the true story of the Horizon scandal has been recognised. As members know, the aim of this bill is to provide a quick, fair and equal solution for all sub-postmasters who were wrongly convicted as a result of the impact of the defective Horizon IT system. Through this bill, we are ensuring that Scottish sub-postmasters are not disadvantaged compared to those in the rest of the UK in respect of the quashing of their convictions and that they are able to access the UK Government Compensation Scheme. To recap, the Bill provides that convictions for relevant offences will be automatically quashed when the Bill comes into force. The Bill sets out five conditions that must be met in order for the conviction to be a relevant offence and therefore be quashed. These conditions are deliberately designed so as not to require any element of discretion in order to be applied, allowing for the automatic quashing of convictions which fall within the ambit of the legislation. The five conditions relate to the date of the offence, the type of the offence, the need for an individual to have been both working in a post office and for the conviction to have arisen in connection with post office business, and the need for the horizon system to have been in use by that post office at the time. During stage two, we agreed an amendment to remove the exclusion of the High Court appeals from the bill. This will ensure fairness in the way we deal with those who may have sought to challenge their conviction by lodging an appeal in the past, especially at a time when the flaws in the Horizon system were not known about. Today, we have agreed a further amendment reflecting the final form of the UK Post Office Horizon System Offences Act. This amendment makes clear that where an offence was alleged to have been committed over a period of time or on unknown dates falling within a period, the offence will still be considered relevant, even in cases where the Horizon system was being used uh, in the post office business for only part of the period. As set out earlier, this amendment ensures a common approach across the UK and avoids anomalies related to the timing of the Horizon system uh, coming into place. Presiding officer, I had signalled my intention to seek to shorten the time frame for receiving royal assent. Once the bill has passed stage three, we will, we will begin the formal process for securing royal assent. In the meantime, officials are already working closely with Justice Partners, the Post Office and UK Government counterparts to ensure we have the frameworks in place to quickly identify and notify those individuals whose convictions are quashed by the Bill. Presiding officer, during stage two, I committed to work with those who had brought forward amendments to respond to the desire for transparency and reporting on the impact of the bill. And I was therefore pleased to introduce a further amendment today, which requires Scottish ministers to prepare, publish and lay a report on the operation of the Act before the Scottish Parliament as soon as reasonably practical after one year has elapsed from the commencement of this bill. The report must include the number of convictions in respect of which Scottish ministers have given notification to a convicting court and to a person under Section 4 of the Bill. The report will also provide information on the steps taken by the Scottish ministers to identify convictions quashed by the Act and to give notifications. 
while the report would not get into the specifics of individual cases, it would include information about the processes followed by ministers in general terms, such as details of the organisations that Scottish ministers engaged with in order to identify convictions and the steps taken to notify individuals, such as engaging tracing agents. I hope that this amendment reassures members that I have fully considered their concerns around transparency. Presiding officer, I am grateful for the consideration that Parliament has already given this bill. Indeed, the amendments lodged by the Scottish Government during Stage 2 and today is a reflection of that consideration and I have no doubt it will result in a significantly stronger bill. There have also been some amendments which have not ultimately been pressed or agreed and while there are sound reasons for the outcome we have reached, I do want to recognise the very good intentions behind those amendments and to welcome the engagement and scrutiny which members have provided and brought to bear. I am also grateful to members of the Parliament for their shared recognition of the urgency of this bill, the swiftness with which we have been able to introduce this key piece of legislation and conclude its parliamentary considerations is a testament to what we can achieve when we are united in a shared commitment. A commitment to address the horrific miscarriage of justice that has ruined the lives of many, a commitment to help Scottish sub-postmasters clear their names and a commitment to ensure they are treated on a par with their counterparts in the rest of the UK. Presiding officer, I know this bill is unprecedented. However, I hope that members will recognise this is the only way we can ensure that Scottish postmasters are not left behind. And I therefore urge all members to join me in their support for this bill. And I move the motion in my name. Thank you. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I now call on Russell Finlay. Uh, up to six minutes, please, Mr Finlay. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, what we saw in the Scottish Parliament yesterday represented the worst kind of politics, entitlement and double standards, taking priority over respect for the rules and for the public. Today, with this expedited legislation, we see a better side of what Parliament can do. The bill was published just 16 days ago, and cross-party work has ensured it passed quickly and smoothly while also ensuring that it receives proper scrutiny and improvements where necessary. Once passed, Scotland's wrongly convicted postmasters will have their names instantly cleared, their criminal convictions quashed. For any parliament to overturn decisions arrived at by independent courts and judges is unprecedented and not done lightly. Last week, the Cabinet Secretary, and again today, recognises the gravity of this measure. I suspect that we are unlikely to see this happen again, and it's notable that the Lord Advocate has been unwilling to say whether she supports this approach, her previous comments suggesting that she does not. But this legislation is necessary due to the seriousness and scale of this egregious and sickening mass miscarriage of justice. The UK Government's legislation was the template for the Scottish legislation. The UK Bill was published on the 13th of March and received royal assent last week. SNP ministers said they wanted the UK legislation to extend to Scotland, which I think is a strange position to take, as they usually find cause to complain at any perceived UK Government meddling. This manufactured fight was wholly unnecessary and not in the interests of Scotland's post office victims. It has always been apparent that Scotland's proudly distinct legal system would require its own distinct bill. That is the most effective way and the right way. Scotland's postmasters were not prosecuted by the post office, but by the Crown Office. Some of the criminal charges used against them are unique to Scots law. It's right that members of this parliament should have been able to scrutinize this legislation as we have done. My party has faith in the Scottish Parliament, even if SNP ministers do not. After this bout of needless posturing from the Scottish Government, standalone Scottish legislation was duly published. In practical terms, we've already seen why this has been beneficial, having been amended and improved over these past 16 days. Last week, the Cabinet Secretary secured an amendment to the Scottish legislation, which we supported. It allows convictions to be quashed even when a previous court appeal failed. She worked with UK ministers to ensure compensation would still apply in any such cases. 
And today, Parliament has agreed to an amendment in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and supported by myself. It requires a post-legislative report to be published and laid before Parliament. Neither of these changes would have happened if the UK Act had been extended to cover Scotland. And even if the Westminster law had applied here, as the SNP say they wanted, they would have then had to pass more legislation to make those specific changes. This would have added to the delays of victims who have already suffered for far too long. Presiding officer, all of this political activity has been in response to a TV drama that aired in the first few days of this year. Mr Bates v the Post Office has had an extraordinary impact, bringing to life what was ostensibly a story about an IT system. It sparked a collective public fury at the injustices inflicted upon decent, honest and hard-working men and women. Men and women branded thieves, men and women whose protestations of innocence were ignored, criminalised and crushed by a faulty computer system, a dishonest post office and prosecutors who took what they were told at face value. Those wrongly convicted in Scotland are on the cusp of having their convictions quashed. But we will probably never be able to establish how many postmasters passed away before justice was done. Fiona Cowan died of an accidental overdose after being charged. Karen Lorimer pled guilty only to avoid being jailed and separated from her young son. Mary Philp was forced to resign in shame. All of these women were innocent, but none of them are alive to see this day. We also cannot possibly know the full extent of the harm inflicted on people and their families. Sisters Rose Stewart and Jackie El Caspi ordered to hand over thousands of pounds after being falsely accused. Rab Thompson forced to plead guilty to a crime that didn't even happen. Keith McEldowie contemplated suicide after being forced to resign and pay thousands of pounds. Presiding officer, today's legislation is not and should not be the end of the story. The post office inquiry will reach its findings and justice may yet follow for the real criminals. I thank you. Thank you, Mr Finlay. I now call on Katie Clark. Up to five minutes, please, Ms Clark. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Scottish Labour supports this legislation and the blanket exoneration of anyone who is convicted based on horizon evidence. All of those affected should have their convictions quashed and indeed access to the compensation fund. We note the assurances provided by the Cabinet Secretary as to who will be covered by this legislation, as we were particularly concerned that family members who are not employees and indeed others who had pled guilty to protect someone else, perhaps a loved one, were included. We will support the legislation as drafted. And we appreciate that this bill was drafted based on the UK Government's legislation, which was passed last Friday. We agree that the use of tainted evidence provided by the post office in criminal cases across the UK is one of the biggest miscarriages of justice in recent history. But we are disappointed that Scotland's separate and distinct legal system did not provide more protection than the rest of the UK and that justice <coughs> partners failed to recognise miscarriages of justice when so many high profile concerns were being raised by campaigners, trade unions, the media, representative organisations, politicians across the political spectrum and so many others. This legislation deals with convictions only, but many who were not prosecuted also faced injustice and repaid false shortfalls, often large amounts of money, were suspended from work or dismissed, were made bankrupt, had family breakdowns, were branded as thieves, within their communities and had problems with their health. Lives were destroyed and individuals were imprisoned. All of those who suffered deserve justice. Across the UK, nearly a thousand people were convicted on the basis of horizon evidence. Increasingly, concerns developed about these convictions over many years with high profile campaigns to expose the injustice. And by 2013, 
individuals within the Crown Office were attempting to stop prosecutions in Scotland, and serious answers need to be given as to why those voices were not listened to at the time and why the Crown Office wished to believe the Post Office when so many believed that it simply was not credible that so many previously law-abiding citizens were acting in an illegal way based on evidence from a computer system and a lack of other evidence or corroboration. It raises serious concerns about how cases were marked and the operation of the courts. By early 2015, the Business Innovation and Skills Committee, uh, of which I was a member at the time, held a special evidence session given the strength of concerns and took evidence both from those affected and the post office. And by that time, these issues were well within the public domain and there had been a number of parliamentary debates. After years of campaigning, the fact that it required a TV drama to lead to this legislation across the UK should be a source of shame for the justice system. In 2015, a group of 555 people took the post office to court, and in 2019, the post office settled the cases for over £57 million. The Court of Appeal in England quashed 39 convictions in 2021. Yet, despite this, Allowing the normal operation of the courts and a justice system to deal with cases on a case-by-case -case basis has been unsuccessful. And it is necessary for this legislation to require the Crown Office to review every case to ensure that every case where there has been a conviction based on tainted, tainted evidence is quashed. Yes, the Post Office may have lied. And it is clear that the politics of privatisation and the wish to please the then Conservative and Liberal coalition government by closing down any problems may have been factors. But the justice system across the UK also has serious questions to answer. We do support this legislation today, but lessons on how a publicly owned body behaved and the ethos which should operate in organisations which we own are not resolved by this legislation and I hope are issues which this Parliament will continue to pursue to make sure this doesn't happen again. Lessons must be learned. Thank you, Ms Clark. I now call on Maggie Chapman. Up to four minutes, please, Ms Chapman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I am pleased to speak this afternoon on behalf of the Scottish Greens in support of the Post Office Horizon System Offences Scotland Bill. It is right that we take this extraordinary step and exonerate those who were wrongly convicted as part of the Post Office Horizon scandal. We are here at stage three of this important bill, even more quickly perhaps than some of us had expected. But I'm glad that Westminster made this a priority in its very last week of its parliament. To misquote the Scottish play, nothing in this UK government's life became it like the leaving of it. And this timing has meant that the passing of this bill is happening just days after the Post Office's former Chief Executive has given evidence at the public inquiry into the Horizon IT system. We couldn't have had starker reminder of why this bill matters. For the evidence, both what has been said at the inquiry and what has not been said shows that however unprecedented the situation is, it was not unlikely to happen. Anthony Montgomery, Professor in Occupational and Organisational Psychology at Northumbria University, has written this week about organisational cover-ups. He points out that the Post Office miscarriages of justice join a long list of institutional and corporate scandals, including the injustices of infected blood and the Hillsborough and Grenfell disasters. The corporate drive to hide, truth, hide the truth is not random, he says, but inevitable when protecting the company is seen as an ethical business principle. When business leaders are rewarded for making profit and shareholder value their paramount goals. What is described as bad corporate culture, says Professor Montgomery, simply means that everybody clearly understood the real vision and objectives and committed to doing what was needed. That's why it is not enough to treat the Post Office Horizon scandal as a one-off freak event, to let it be quietly forgotten, to continue with business as usual. 
The injustice that has been endured by post office sub-postmasters, workers and their families and communities is not only the injustice of a particular system that has gone wrong, it is the inescapable final result of unfettered toxic capitalism itself. That is why I proceeded with further amendments to this bill earlier this afternoon. My amendments made no changes to its main provisions to the urgent and essential work of quashing those terrible and oppressive convictions. They simply asked the Scottish Government to report on the law that we have, the law that we lack, and the support we can give to those who are seeking justice. For there must be real consequences when people, pay, when people play with other people's lives for profit, status and reward. And there must be real changes to a system that too often listens to the loudest voices, those amplified by privilege, and fails to hear the truth. Today we acknowledge that truth, we recognise injustice, and we extend our solidarity, our sorrow and our gratitude to those who have fought with courage and compassion for this moment. I am pleased to support this bill. Thank you. Thank you. I now call on Alex Cole-Hamilton. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Presiding Officer. It gives me great pleasure to rise for the Liberal Democrats in support of this important and historic piece of legislation. Presiding Officer, when I think of the sub-postmasters in my own constituency, I think of public servants who, uh, for very little money, um, offer a, a service above and beyond the call of duty in more cases than not. Um, I see a reflection of the duties that we perform as parliamentarians in terms of the community service they offer. There is a public role that they perform, but also there is, I think, a pastoral element of support that they offer um, the customers who regularly visit their post offices. Um, I think it's... It's so sad that it's taken us so long to get to this point. It's so sad that it has taken an ITV drama to bring this to the public consciousness sufficient to see legislative change and amendment that should, by rights, have happened many years ago. I am glad we are here. In truth, it, we should have arrived at this point uh, far, far before now. I think it's uh, frustrating that much of this process has been defined by confusion as to whether the government backed blanket exonerations uh, in the first place. Opposition uh, parties had been calling for the Lord Advocate to address this chamber for weeks before she finally did to offer that clarity. And that clarity was that it was up to us. And I, I, I think that we've finally risen to that challenge and the challenge of her words in the pages of this legislation. For the sake of the victims of this scandal, I'm glad we are making some progress. And this has been one of the most egregious, appalling miscarriages of justice in our national story. Livelihoods destroyed, reputations damaged, lives ruined. We have heard heartbreaking testimony in this chamber this afternoon of the individual cases of lives that were cut short or lives that were ruined. And one Scottish victim spoke recently of how he planned suicide and had to be sectioned due to the trauma he had experienced. This is somebody who was just going about his daily job, thinking he was doing, doing it right, um, realised the sums didn't add up, had the finger pointed it at him by his employers, um, just couldn't understand where this mistake had taken place, but started to believe, in some cases, the, the people who were accused started to believe they must have done something wrong. False confessions were extracted on that basis. This gentleman said that the government's lack of clarity around whether he would have to go back to court to have his conviction overturned had made things worse. He is just sadly one of many, but we've righted that wrong today. We know that around 100 people were wrongly convicted by the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service in this country based on evidence provided by the Post Office, evidence presiding officer that we have seen unravel in the weeks in glorious technicolour in the National Inquiry and in the testimony of people like Paul Vennels. Former Post Office workers across all four nations in our islands have rightly, tirelessly per pursued the justice that they have been denied for so long. It is vital, vital presiding officer that they now get justice and the redress they are entitled to as quickly as possible. Yes, I know the UK Parliament has risen, but that should not act as an impediment to the financial recompense that these workers so rightly deserve. I'm glad that as a Parliament we speak with one voice today in the passing of this legislation, and my party are proud to support it. Thank you. Thank you. We move to the open debate, and I call Audrey Nicholl to be followed by Jamie Green.
Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I am pleased to speak in this stage the debate on the Post Office Horizon Bill, an emergency bill allowing the Scottish Parliament to legislate at pace to overturn convictions linked to the Post Office Horizon IT system. We are all familiar with the faulty software in the Horizon accounting system that aimed to reduce fraud in local post office branches, but became the focus of one of the most significant injustices in our legal history. And I pay tribute to the postmasters who, despite being bullied and intimidated by the post office, have worked tirelessly to expose the failings of the post office, a greedy and reckless corpora corporation, the sole shared holder of which is the UK Government. The quickest and easiest route to overturn the numerous miscarriages of justice would have been for the UK Government to extend its own bill to cover sub-postmasters in Scotland. But unfortunately, the Scottish Government's repeated requests for that were refused. Nevertheless, the bill before us at stage three should serve symbolic and practical purposes under the overturned conviction scheme established by the UK Government. If I, I won't today, thank you. So it is welcome that many wrongful convictions have already been overturned. However, it does feel as though the pace of progress is far too slow. The bill will help, help expedite this process. And I note the Law Society's recognition that the cases related to the Horizon system dramatically affected a significant number of people who have been seeking justice for many years. And having a case-by-case -case approach to a significant number of convictions will be a slow mechanism that may impede those affected in obtaining the recognition and compensation they deserve. During the Stage 1 debate, members told heartbreaking stories of the shameful way constituents were treated by the Post Office over many years, compounded by the fact that the Horizon system was faulty. And yet, as Claire Adamson stated in her Stage 1 contribution, it took a TV drama to shift the dial on the issue. We know many people who have suffered these injustices have not come forward, and not everyone who was wrongly accused is still with us. And I therefore welcome the proposals in the Bill for these individuals to have the wrong that they suffered addressed. I welcome the amendments made at Stage 2 that seek to ensure everyone whose conviction meets the criteria of the Bill will have their conviction quashed, regardless of previous appeal decisions. Maggie Chapman articulated the rationale for this very well in her stage two contribution supporting the government amendment. I also welcome today's amendments that alters the criteria for a relevant offence, thereby ensuring that where the offence was alleged to be committed over a period of time, there is no requirement for Horizon to have been used for all the period, only some. And I also welcome the inclusion of a reporting requirement into the Bill. This is absolutely appropriate in these very unique circumstances. And I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's commitment to providing the Criminal Justice Committee with an interim update. So, Presiding Officer, in closing, we do not have the power to turn back time, but we do have the power to stand up for those who have been wronged so badly to publicly declare the wrongdoing and, in so far as is possible, help them find the place they would have been in their lives but for this injustice. Thank you. Thank you. I call Jamie Green to be followed by Martin Whitfield. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, can I first of all start by paying credit to the fact that we have our current and former First Minister in the Chamber today? I think that signifies the importance of the bill that we're passing this afternoon, and I welcome their presence. And I want to begin my remarks by repeating what I said at the stage one debate, as many others have done, and that's pay tribute to the sub postmasters and their families uh, up and down this country, because what happened to them should never have happened, and it should never happen again. I don't have any party political points to make today. I know it's an election period, because I don't think the victims of the scandal are much interested in our own grievances between one and another. And I also need to be clear that I've always been uncomfortable with legislation of this nature. Um, I think when politicians quash en masse court convictions, I don't think that's something that should ever come easily or naturally to us. 
However, in the circumstances, it absolutely is the only thing that we could do. And I also think emergency law is not ideal either, and I've made that clear in the past. And let me explain why. Because I think, sadly, even though we will pass this bill today, there remains a cohort of people for whom this bill offers no recourse or much comfort, and at the very least still remains some doubt as to whether they are covered by it or not, or whether they would benefit from it or not. And I take those two examples that I uh, used last time and have been much rehearsed already in the chamber. The first, uh, both from my hometown of Greenock, as it happens. The first is that of Keith McEldowie, because he has no conviction to quash today. But he was given that disgraceful ultimatum, resign or be prosecuted. And the effect of that is incalculable on him. This bill does nothing for him or actually people like him. What is on offer, though, is compensation. And the Horizon shortfall scheme that's been set up by the UK government is welcome, but I think far too many people are not aware of it or how they can use it. I think there's an incumbent uh, position on both governments here to make sure that every victim of the scandal receives every bit of compensation that they deserve. And the second example, which has already been rehearsed today, and we discussed it in the amendment stage, is that of Ravinder Naga, and the point was well made by Martin Whitfield, because he didn't work for or in the post office, but it was a family business. And when told that £35,000 was missing from their post office, he did what any of us would do to protect his own mother. He took the blame and he was convicted. He got 300 hours of community service and still has a criminal record. But the very fact that media reports today were insinuating that his own lawyers publicly stated that they have no idea if this bill will exonerate him or not, I think that's symptomatic of a failure on our part to offer much needed clarity ahead of today or ahead of stage three. In fact, his own lawyer was, and I am paraphrasing what was said, that he could not be sure if his client would be cleared by this legislation and inferred that he hoped that he may be. Well, they should have that clarity already. Victims should have that clarity. In fact, it seems to me that they will only know if they've had their convictions quashed uh, when ministers undertake their obligations under Section 4 notifications. They shouldn't have to wait that long. They should know already. And equally frustrating, we're passing laws where we have no idea how many people will be exonerated today. The financial memorandum talked about one to 2,000 people. The Cabinet Secretary talked to a number of around 200. The Criminal Cases Review Commission said they'd wrote to 73 people. And the Crown said it could be around 54. And the problem is, and notwithstanding the reporting duty that's been added, I don't think it's good enough that neither we in this chamber today or the government knows exactly how many, how many people will wake up with a conviction quashed. Uh, that's because we bypass the evidence gathering and reporting elements of stage one that we would normally do as we sat as a parliament, a committee of the parliament. This sort of detail would have been on earth, I think, in due course. And that's something we should reflect on. And lastly and finally is this observation. This should not and cannot be the end of the journey. There are still many unanswered questions. The Crown Office have unanswered questions. The current and former law ad advocates uh, have questions to answer as to why so many people were prosecuted simply on the basis of the evidence provided, evidence that went unchallenged. Why did nobody question why suddenly all these people, dozens of people, had overnight turned into thieves and criminals and fraudsters? And perhaps more will come out of that in due course. This bill today exonerates the victims of miscarriage, miscarriages of justice, not the, those who wrongly prosecuted them. They are not exonerated. They need compensation, whatever their circumstances. And I, they also need a commitment from us, we as politicians, that we will ensure that nothing like this, nothing like this ever, ever happens again. Presiding officer. Thank you. And I call Martin Whitfield, the final speaker in the open debate. Um, can I thank you, presiding officer? And it is a pleasure to follow Jamie Green's contribution, which I think highlights a lot of the unanswered questions that have come out through this. But I am grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for a stronger confirmation I think is possible to have been given with regard to the specific case that we are talking about. But there are still other cases out there that they're unsure. There are a number of individuals who are still not being paid their pensions because of decisions taken by the post office over guilt or innocence. And so there is still much work to be done. So this is in no way, I think, to reflect um, on Maggie Chapman's contribution, no way the end of this story, but actually it is an ongoing. And some of the amendments that fell today, for which I understand why the government were unable to support them, but they still pose those questions that this chamber and this parliament should look to. 
But I do think it is an opportunity to put on the record again the work of the Cabinet Secretary and my um, colleague Pauline McNeill and the fact that through hard work prevailed with a very short time there have been movements forward in it. So um, to echo the concerns that Jamie Green had about emergency legislation, it may be interesting to have found out where we were if we could have dealt with it in another matter. But all of that rests, of course, because of the challenge that the post office took up in not telling the truth. We know in 2013 representations from the post office came up to Scotland to meet with senior procurator fiscals because they were worried the Crown Office was planning to stop prosecuting cases. Perhaps they were concerned that if the Crown did that, the alarm bells would start ringing both north and south of the border and people would start to question the cases being prosecuted across the United Kingdom. And we need to be clear because the representatives from the post office were wholly concerned with protecting the reputation of the post office and not the growing number of victims who were having their lives destroyed by a faulty computer system. And as Alex Cole Hamilton rightly pointed out, one of the things our community looks to our post offices for is that public service element. I'm aware of um, post office uh, workers who have prevented substantial sums being withdrawn from someone's bank account in a fraudulent claim. They are the front line in so many problems that, you know, our constituents go to with. And to have been treated like this by their employer, by the organisation that was the umbrella group of where they worked is truly atrocious. It is sobering to think that if the post office hadn't lied, and I choose my words very carefully, presiding officer, to the Crown, and it had stopped prosecuting those cases in 2013, then where would we be today? How many lives would not have been ruined? How many lives would not have been lost? There are ongoing questions, which I know will stay on the Cabinet Secretary's desk, and I hope she's able to make mention in summing up of some of them. In particular, the very low number of applications from the 19 individuals through the Kim Criminal Cases Review Commission. We need to know why that figure is so low. I know it has been difficult to assess given the passage of time, but surely these cases are relatively recent, and I don't believe that the Crown should be struggling to find the details of the individuals that have been prosecuted as much as they have been. Because the consequences of this is a dire impact on those individuals. And with regard to prosecutions, you know, there clearly needs to be effort put in to finding those responsible for this horrendous scandal. Again, to speak to the amendments that weren't successful today. I'm given to understand there are a significant number of detectives working on this and we look forward to it because this is an ongoing case. I understand that the investigations are looking at perverting the course of justice, perjury, potential fraud by senior officials at the post office, as well as Fujitsu, who should get a mention today. There are at least 20 potential suspects who have been identified. But this is an important moment when this bill passes. It is an important moment for those that observe this from the outside, and it is an important moment for those individuals who have been affected but it is just a moment in an ongoing campaign that needs to happen to make sure nothing like this ever happens again. But that is said so frequently about many things, but more importantly, so the people, their family, their friends, the communities who have suffered see that we will hold the people to account that caused this. I'm grateful, Presiding Officer. Thank you. We move to winding up speeches and I call on Maggie Chapman up to four minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'll be brief in my closing remarks because what matters here today is not the party political points we make or our speeches in support of this bill. What matters is that we do all support this bill. Because what matters even more is that those wrongly convicted by the egregious post office horizon scandal will see their convictions quashed. I am very grateful that this bill will pass today, and I thank all of those who have ensured that it has been possible to get to this point so rapidly, but still with real and effective scrutiny. I am pleased to have had the opportunity to lodge amendments and to speak to them, even if the Chamber decided not to add to the Westminster model on the issues I raised. It is vital that we learn lessons from this grave injustice, that we work to ensure we make real change that we remember that it is an example not of corporate systems failing, 
but are they doing exactly what they are designed to do, to protect their own interests and almost getting away with it? I read with interest an article earlier this week that the Metropolitan Police are preparing for a large criminal inquiry into this issue. And of course, we watch and wait for the conclusions of the public inquiry with interest. But those are not for now. Because in closing, presiding officer, I want to remember again all those who have been affected by the scandal, the sub, the sub -postmasters, postmasters affected, their families, their communities. Today is for them, and it is for them that we pass this legislation. Thank you. Thank you. And I call on Michael Mara. Up to four minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. Scottish Labour welcomes the swift process of this legislation through Parliament over the last couple of weeks, and will gladly vote for it shortly at decision time. Uh, all of this could have happened at any point over the last decade and more, when it has obviously been required. Um, members have told the stories today of victims and their families and the repercussions of um, this uh, gross and grand scandal. And we can hope that those victims and families will be feeling that their long fight for justice, uh, which followed the longer fight to be believed, is at last progressing. Uh, Martin Whitfield said, and I think rightly so, that this is just a moment in that longer process. And I'd say that Paula Venel's appearance at the Post Office inquiry over recent days has begun to put a public face for uh, the public in general to the, those who are culpable in this situation. And criminal charges must follow, as other members have said. The cover-ups, the lies, the corporate culture of self-serving greed that was laid out in emails and in that hard-wrung testimony cannot be masked by tears from the people giving evidence to that inquiry. So while the process of this legislation has been uh, swift, it has not been without concerns. Members across the chamber, I think, clearly retain significant doubts as to the position of the Crown Prosecution Service and the apparent, uh, sorry, the, 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 yes, the Crown Prosecution Service and the, the apparent reluctance in the testimony of the Lord Advocate in Parliament to accept that defects in Horizon were known and publicly reported as far back as 2009. They were widely known in legal circles um, as prosecution, prosecutors continued, uh, the, the calls for reconsideration were silenced or ignored. Katie Clark pointed out that those voices in the Crown Office were raising concerns as far back as 2013. They were not listened to. Why not? And all of this is, I think it's vital that all of this says to us it was vital that this law was considered here. And I have, do still struggle to understand the government's reluctance to see this law passed in this parliament. We heard that the former First Minister was utterly furious, that he believed it to be outrageous that it was suggested that we do this. But it's absolutely vital. And it's, I have to say, it's increasingly difficult to understand much of what the SNP government does in recent days. But it is absolutely clear that this should have been considered here, and for good reason, because we are here to scrutinise the institutions that are caught up in this process. And the Prosecution Service still defends its right today to, uh, to, uh, to believe trusted institutions, brands, the establishment, in the face of the evidence that is put in front of them. So I do find the calls and the idea of never again to be difficult, presiding officer. Yeah, to give much credence to. We can think of Hillsborough, we can think of Bloody Sunday, we can think of institutional, institutional child sexual abuse, rolling on for years and years and years. But there are issues that are only coming alive today in processes. For instance, the infected blood scandal, the Elgimel inquiry uh, uh, for what has happened to the people of Tayside. All of these, I believe, have common traits within them. Do you believe the brand, the badge, the uniform, the school tie? Or do you invest in those signs and signals? Or do you believe the victims, the evidence, no matter how difficult that might be, about how difficult it might be to you to believe, or how difficult it might be to hear? Because it is a question of power, presiding officer. It's about the proximity of politics to institutions. How do we address these issues? Because I do fear that we will be here again, but we will gladly vote for this law. Thank you. And I call on Sharon Dowie up to five minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As my colleagues have said, the Scottish Conservatives welcome this long overdue legislation. 
its expedited process and support mass exoneration of the Scottish victims of this appalling scandal. It is right that we act quickly to correct, as best we can, this shameful episode in the post office's history. Many contributions across the Chamber reflected the real strength of feeling and the raw emotions this situation has provoked. But I do not think we will ever be able to feel and appreciate the pain and injustice that post office workers have suffered. Russell Finlay made strong contributions on how tragic this whole affair has been and the terrible consequences it has had for many people and their families. We can never really reflect how hard this has been for post office workers, often the most upstanding members of the community, to have their reputation destroyed for no good reason. That is why, as Alex Cole Hamilton said, it is so vital that this legislation is implemented as soon as possible. The bill before us may not be perfect, but it is workable and it delivers the resolution that post office workers deserve. I note the concerns of many legal experts that this bill could set a precedent and it represents interference in the judicial system. While it is right we acknowledge and recognise those concerns, we believe the bill takes the right approach. This is an exceptional circumstance and it deserves an extraordinary response. I welcome the changed approach taken in Section 1, which means convictions that have already been reconsidered by the High Court will not be excluded from exoneration under this legislation. My party also supports the approach in Section 5, which deals with alternatives to prosecution. It is only right that everyone who received any kind of warning or fiscal fine in relation to this scandal receives exoneration. I also want to pick up on the points made by Russell Finlay, Audrey Nicholl, Katie Clark and Michael Mara about the SNP Government's approach to this process. We must all admit that more could have been done and action could have been taken sooner by all involved. But we must reflect on why an SNP Government in Scotland did not act more quickly to resolve this. The SNP have tried to deflect blame and responsibility throughout the last few months instead of focusing solely on what can be done to help the situation. And those shouting in the back were here for the whole debate, so you don't know what was said. Mm -hmm. um, and as the Cabinet Secretary said earlier on, today shows what we can do when we work together, united in a shared commitment. This scandal has also once again thrown up in lights the role of the Crown Office in Scotland and the need for reform. As Jamie Green said, in Scotland, the Crown Office was responsible for prosecutions and they appear to have taken very questionable and downright dubious decisions long after they became aware of issues with the Horizon system. There has still been no real accountability for those failings and further investigation is undoubtedly required so we can uncover how and why these prosecutions happened as they did. Finally, Martin Whitfield was right to highlight the post office itself. Earlier this month, we found out that the post office, who is inevitably at the centre of this scandal, has been stripped of its status of being a specialist reporting agency. This certainly cannot right the wrongs it has caused, but it may come as a small piece of comfort to those who have suffered due to this scandal. And can also thank the Cabinet Secretary for taking it at Amendment 22 and working with us to improve it and bringing it in as Stage 3. To conclude, Presiding Officer, this bill is necessary to give post office workers who did nothing wrong the exoneration that they have deserved for many years. Although this bill cannot reverse time, it will give victims of this scandal some small measure of justice for what they went through. The duty is now on Scottish ministers to quickly identify the relevant convictions and inform the victims as swiftly as possible. I expect it to be a top priority for them, as it must be, and I hope we all learn the lessons of this scandal so a similar situation is never allowed to happen again. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you. And I now call on the Cabinet Secretary to wind up the debate. Up to six minutes, please. 
Thank you very much, President Officer, and I wish to start by thanking my officials who have worked exceptionally hard on uh, the preparation involved in bringing this bill forward and bringing it forward at pace and to pay tribute to their painstaking work, uh, but also to their patience, uh, not least uh, for the putting up with the Cabinet Secretary. Oops. Clap, clap for the civil servants. Um, once again, presiding officer, um, I do want to reiterate my thanks to parliamentary colleagues um, across the chamber. I would, of course, like to emphasise that working together isn't a one-way street. It requires everybody to communicate. It requires everybody uh, to change a wee bit and uh, at least move forward uh, together um, a little bit. But I am uh, appreciative uh, that Parliament as a whole agreed to this bill being an emergency bill, notwithstanding the challenges that that presents, as well as the, the opportunities that it brings. And of course, should this bill pass today, as I very much hope and anticipate it will, it will do so only one week after the UK bill was passed at Westminster. And that in itself was accelerated uh, due to the uh, general election being announced. And I am not going to uh, revisit or rehash uh, past arguments. I know the UK government legislate all the time for Scotland, and sometimes I cooperate with that, and sometimes I object. But today is not about the politicians, it's not about our political parties uh, or indeed uh, our institutions. It is uh, wholly and squarely about sub postmasters uh, here in Scotland and their friends and families who have been affected tragically uh, by this scandal. And the central aim of this bill is, of course, to quash wrongful convictions that resulted from the use of defective Horizon IT system. And I hope that the bill is a recognition of the scale of the miscarriage of justice and that it will go some way to allowing all of those who have suffered to feel vindicated and that, that this will help to restore uh, their reputations among the communities they serve. I, of course, share the discomfort uh, that Jamie Green ex expressed with uh, primary legislation automatically uh, quashing uh, convictions. But the nature and the scale of this miscarriage uh, of justice has meant that this legislation has been absolutely necessary Although, as Justice Secretary, I have to put on record that it does not uh, set a precedent. But the low responses from the sterling efforts from the Scottish Criminal Cases Review, and they didn't just put a letter in the post attached with a first-class stamp. I know they went to extensive efforts. They employed tracing agents. They went above and beyond. But that low response speaks to the scale in which people have lost faith with our justice system. And that is why it is now necessary to remove the onus from individuals and to move the onus, in this case, eh, back on to the state where the responsibility eh, in this instance lies. As I've previously said, President Officer, I recognise that the scale of the scandal goes beyond those who were prosecuted and convicted. There were many sub-postmasters who were forced to repay supposed shortfalls uh, created uh, by the, the faulty software. And they deserve uh, not just their sympathy, uh, but our support. And like others in the debate today, saying that there are many lessons to be learned doesn't quite capture the magnitude uh, of the change that now has to take place. And I do, however, uh, have faith and hope uh, in the Wynne Williams inquiry that that is the route to address the issues uh, that go beyond this bill. For my part, President Officer, I will of course continue to engage with the relevant UK ministers uh, once they are in place after the general election, uh, most likely on the issue of compensation, because the most recently announced scheme is still to be established. And again, on behalf of the Scottish Government, we will certainly look uh, to make targeted interventions to ensure that people are indeed informed of, of their rights. Presiding officer, one of the themes that has uh, come up from today's debate, I suppose, is that collective sense of shame that it took a TV programme, as Audrey Nicholls says, 
to, to shift the dial. And I suppose by some way of personal atonement, I would commend to people uh, the book by Nick Wallace uh, entitled The Great Post Office Scandal. Because in that book, he narrates that the, the post office holds a unique position in our society right across all the home nations of the UK. And as history students will know, the general post office it predates the Industrial Revolution, the British Empire, and indeed the establishment of Britain itself. It is the oldest government agency, and until recent times, it was the main interface uh, between state and citizens. And the impact of this injustice is profound and shocking and the reverberations of it will be felt for some time to come. And I want to end, President Officer, by quoting uh, the words of Seema Mishra, who was the former West Byfleet sub-postmaster. And her words in July 2021 uh, in the book by uh, Nick Wallace, when she said of herself and her husband, in 2005, Devinder and I invested our own money in a post office branch and retail business where we were proud to have become part of such a famous British institution. When I was sentenced to prison on my eldest son's 10th birthday, all of our dreams and hopes were destroyed. When I was convicted of theft in 2010, my faith and belief in justice was shattered. I was pregnant at the time. My despair caused me to think of suicide. Thoughts of my unborn child kept a bit of hope and me alive. And also, President Officer, the words of uh, Jafinder Borang um, outside the court in Southwark at the end of 2020 when her conviction was, was overturned. And she said, when we've had our down days, we've been there for each other. And she's speaking of the solidarity of those affected and the campaigners. And on the day um, her conviction was overturned, she says, I can now get on with the rest of my life now. It's the worst thing to be found guilty for something that you haven't done. I'm a law-abiding citizen, and today is just absolutely wonderful. Signing officer, while this bill cannot change the past, I am profoundly grateful to colleagues in this chamber in helping to get it through Parliament quickly, allowing us to at least go some way to writing the wrongs that have been done and to provide some comfort and I hope the pathway to redress for those that have been so unfairly treated. And I am delighted that members have indicated their support for the bill, meaning that this important bill be passed at decision time tonight to rectify, to help rectify this injustice, quash these wrongful convictions and enable Scottish sub-postmasters to access the financial dress they rightly deserve. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes the debate on Post Office Horizon System Offences Scotland Bill at Stage 3. It is now time to move on to the next item of business. And there is one question to be put as a result of today's business. The question is that motion 13407 in the name of Angela Constance on Post Office Horizon System Offences Scotland Bill be agreed. And as this is a motion to pass the bill at stage three, the question must be decided by division. So there will be a short suspension to allow members to access the digital voting system.